members of a community. It was a church family, a true church family. An unspeakable secret. I talk about stuff like that on the phone, baby. I know. I know, baby. She told me if this got out, we would lose everybody. And the murder that shakes a small town to its core. We're all just, excuse my term, dumbfounded. Told for the first time. I did what she told me. I didn't say anything until now. The shocking true story of the Gatesville fire. It truly is a made-for-TV case. He was on a mission from God. He's just a con man. I was afraid that he would find out that I told. memory I really remember of David is when they got married. He was real caring, and he loved my mom. She was a wonderful person. Well, believe it or not, she had had her hair curled the longest and had done well. <laughs> mom and David were married August 1st of 1992. The idea of them getting married and having him around more, it was, it was fun. I remember preparing for that day and wanting to do something special. And someone else was going to write Just Married on the back of their car, and I wanted 10 cans. I remember that being a big deal, and I worked on it that weekend. And after the wedding, when they drove off, I remember crying because, I don't know, maybe I was crying because mom was leaving for the weekend, or I cried because my cans fell off. And I was heartbroken, and I cried. I'm not really sure how my mom and David met. When they first got together, they weren't really religious. We didn't go to church. David actually smoked cigarettes, he drank, but I don't remember that being a bad thing. I remember him being fun. That changed after the accident. We were driving. I remember David looking across the seat at my sister and he just went off the road. No one was hurt. I guess that's why I didn't understand why my mother was so upset. I was telling her, Mom, it's okay. It's okay. And she just said, no, it's not okay. This is not okay. I don't know if she was just that frightened that we could have all been terribly hurt or what it was, but that was just a turning point. That wreck, that's what changed their lives. You know, I mean, life is a roller coaster ride enough as it is. But when you've got Jesus, when you've got the joy of the Lord inside of you, it doesn't matter what's going on outside. David just kind of took over. But it was kind of odd. Like, putting on a show is what it felt like. They both loved helping people. I mean, ministry was both of their callings. David was a really good guy. He knew how to talk to people. He was very encouraging, and my mom did too. I mean, they listened to everyone's concerns. I felt just kind of left out just because I was the daughter and, you know, and that they had a big role in the church. I wasn't so much involved in it. It was kind of lonely in the house. 
it affected me kind of in a way to where, I mean, I know being a pastor, you're supposed to be involved in a church, but I always thought it was being, you know, involved with the family as well. It was a church family, a true church family. We spent a lot of time together. I first met Paula when I was working in a department store and she came in shopping. She wanted to know, you know, where I lived, where I went to church. And when I told her that I didn't, you know, I hadn't found a home church around here, as she was just so quick to be like, well, you know, we have one for you. Come, you're gonna love it. The church from the outside when you pulled up looked pretty plain, but then you go into the sanctuary, it was big, open, and then there was a really big, beautiful cross at the end of it. Paula was away talking with a group of people. When she turned and noticed me, such a beautiful big smile and just immediately just came to me and was just so genuinely happy that we were there. Paula told me that her husband David would be preaching and that I wouldn't be sorry that I came. He definitely was on fire for the Lord. I mean, he was. Inside that church building, I just felt at peace. I mean, walking through the doors was, that was my happy place. Whenever the doors were open, we were in church. But I was uncomfortable being there. He has a purpose. Things started to change a lot at home. David was more strict, but understandably so. He was a Christian. He wanted his family to reflect that. So I moved out of the house when I was around 17, and I felt free in a way of being out from under the church. But after time, there was a distance between me and my mom. Hey, oh my gosh. Hey, ladies. When my sister Melissa got engaged, it gave me and my mom the opportunity to really reconnect. And we picked out dresses together. Let's try these gloves. I think they'll be yeah. perfect mm -hmm. for you. We were texting and talking daily. It was exciting. We really reconnected that last few months. And we just, we weren't prepared. You don't really prepare for, you know, I'll never get to see this person again. I'll never. I was on my honeymoon. I don't even remember what time it was. My husband had gotten the call. <laughs> and I remember just sitting on the bed and just I was so confused. I was like, this is not real. 911, where's your emergency? I can't get to the back room. Ma'am, what is in the Nine one one, where's your emergency? I can't get to the back room. <laughs> <laughs> he, can't, he won't calm down enough for me to figure out where he's at. Ma'am, ma'am, sir. Ma'am, what is in the house? Where are you, sir? I am at New Life Church in the trailer house behind it. New Life Church, the trailer yes, house behind, behind it. it. There's a trailer behind it. Around one o'clock, I got the got the call from the sheriff's department. We've had a fire, and they told me where it was. It was the 
house behind the church where the pastor and the pastor's wife lived. In counties our size, we don't have a coroner. So the justice of the peace takes on the role of the coroner. I don't get a call unless they know there's a fatality. I can remember pulling in and it was completely engulfed by the time I got there. The wind was blowing so hard that night, it had to be blowing 30 mile an hour, sustained winds. And there's no way to hardly fight it when you're combating winds. All the Gatesville Fire Department, seemed like all of their trucks was there and everybody on scene scrambling, trying to put out the fire. I can remember David Allen, he was, he was very frantic, running around, he was hysterical saying, my wife's in there, my wife's in there. He was trying to get in a window, and they had pulled him back out. There was no way nobody could enter the house. We're all just, excuse my term, but dumbfounded. You know, oh Lord, how, this is terrible, how could this happen? At the time that it was under control, the firefighters go to looking for Miss Allen. And I remember when we found her, she was laying face up at the front door like she was trying to get out. And it just, you know, that just really hits your heart there. How long were you guys married? 18 years. Yeah, this is really hard, man. I know. I can't imagine, you know. I do. I think in my mind, is, is, I'm doing the best I can. I know this is important for you. So when you felt the smoke and the noise, you went and opened the window and... As soon as I opened that window, man, it was like... <sighs> this huge suction went out the window and I ran to the front door and it was it was locked but that's where the fire was the fire was right there by the time I got there um, it was already breaking the windows I and mean, it was it went so fast that's when I called 911 when I ran back around I thought I'm gonna call it and just chuck my phone and that's exactly what I did I I was screaming for Paul to wake up, wake up, get up, wake up. I was running around the house, wake up, wake up, get up, beating on the walls, beating on the windows, wake up, get up, wake up, get up. Well, I don't have a lot else I got to ask you. Um, basically, it was just to get the version of uh, what occurred, you know, while it was still fresh and get you away from there. And um, One other thing I would like to know, does, is there a life insurance policy for her? Um, I don't um, we went to get life insurance, and they turned us down because of me. Do um, you want to have somebody come pick you up? I really don't think that you should go back out there. You know, honestly, I don't want you to go back out there. I was woken up about 3 in the morning by my aunt and uncle uh, at my door. And they told me, there's been a fire and your mom didn't make it out. I don't really remember really it registering what they had just said. And I remember asking my aunt, you know, we need to call Melissa. We had to get her back to town so that we could plan a funeral. I was on my honeymoon. My husband had gotten the call and had told me that my mom didn't make it out. And of course, he tried consoling me. And, and I, just, I just remember being in a disbelief. I just, I, it just didn't feel real. I, I didn't get it. I was confused. I didn't understand what had happened in the house, what started the fire. 
I had tons of questions. When I arrived, the fire department was still on the scene, and I talked to the sheriff deputies, and they had told me there was no red flags. It doesn't matter if the locals tell me what they think. I have to make my own opinion. I needed to investigate for the possibility of homicide. Conducting my fire scene investigation, I observed burn patterns and fire travel movement. And I was able to determine the area of origin to be the living room. Looking around that room, there was no candles, kerosene lamps, oil lamps. They did not smoke, so I could eliminate accidental causes. The next part of my investigation is to check the weather at the time of the fire to see what the wind patterns were, the humidity, lightning in the area. I was able to rule out that it was weather related. I noticed a lot of electrical wiring in the wall in the area of origin. So we asked an electrical engineer to come and see if he could determine anything. And he was able to eliminate electrical causes of this fire. Electrical, accidental, and natural sources of ignition were ruled out, making this an intentionally set fire, an arson. I started looking for how they might have set it, such as ignitable liquids. Samples are collected in the area of origin and submitted to a lab. Then we start to see who might have said it. And I needed to do interviews with the church members. I met with Janine. I just wanted her to have all the information that I had so she could investigate it and come out with the truth. It was either February or March. Paula and I were talking about the finances in the office. She needed some help doing the IRS stuff, so I told her that I was going to come and help her. I went to the office, and I started to go through the files, and uh, that's when I came upon the fact that bills weren't paid. The bills were just put into the file cabinet. David took money that he should have spent on bills, and he actually, he did things for the church. David just said, God will take care of it. God will take care of it. The church needs to know what's going on. So I started talking to some members of the board, and that's when they found out what was going on with finances. And they just were going to take care of what needed to be taken care of. After Paula had passed away, I heard the ladies discussing something. It's like on one day, we all just knew we had to come out. There's something going on in the church not a lot of people know about. She said everybody was going to be really shocked when it happened. I was like, yeah, well, there's a lot of things people don't know about if they only knew. She told you that? In so many words, yes. And then three days later, Paula's yes. dead. It was such a tragedy and you know we're trying to figure out exactly what happened and that night there was nothing to depict that there was any foul play within a few hours we get a, a preliminary autopsy report and it come back smoke inhalations and thermal burns it was determined an accident And then the next thing I know, investigators, they're talking to me, thinking there's something going on. 
I had found out that the church was having financial problems, it was not solvent. And so we started digging more. And that's when they found out that the Allens did not have insurance on the uh, home. The church had insurance. And so the church were going to receive the benefits of the policy. So that was a red flag. We purchased the house. And so the church did have insurance on it. And yes, I had to contact the insurance company following the fire. I needed to investigate to see if somebody set the fire, not meaning to harm David or Paula, and just wanted to burn down the building. I thought there was some kind of financial motive. It wasn't until the funeral. That's when the investigation took a new turn. At the funeral, I was always constantly with David, making sure he was okay. If he needed anything, I wouldn't got it. He was a good friend of mine. I just wanted to be there for him. I never left his side. When we buried my mom, we buried her in David's family plot. The double headstone with David's name on it, and it was kind of always talked about that that's where she would be. At our funeral, I just started to see stuff and it was like a light bulb went off and I was like, this just isn't right. I thought the investigators, they needed to know what we knew about. After the funeral, I started getting calls from the church members. Suddenly, everybody wanted to talk. Some things didn't seem right to them. You attended the funeral? Attended the service, the service. they had oh. for him right after she died. Mm -hmm. What do you recall? I could just kind of see her watching David throughout the evening, you know, constantly. I noticed that just her flirting with him and just having to be close to young When you say her, are you referring to Megan? Megan I've got other names, but I can't repeat them. Megan was another member of the church. She is a very beautiful lady. And she really looked up to David. She took notes from every sermon that he gave. Megan was waiting for God to bring her the right man. It had to be a godly man. She told me over and over again, oh, I want a husband so bad. But yeah, she only had eyes for David. That was totally obvious. We could just see what was happening a long time ago before the fire. Megan's pretty young. And she's pretty, you know, all that good stuff. Yeah, how would you characterize their relationship? I mean, I knew that she was in love with my stepdad. I went to school with Megan. So I've known Megan for a very long time. She was obsessed with David. That's how I saw it. She was just obsessed with David. Was it something that you think that Dave was uh, encouraging in any way? No. I told Paula to be careful. Paula would say, oh no, Julie, she's just a young girl. She didn't notice it for a while. I remember when it really impacted her was in October of 2010. We had a carnival at the church, and she happened to look out and noticed David and Megan had just come off of a ride, standing side by side, facing each other, and I saw her beautiful brown eyes turn black with anger. And David was like, it's nothing, Paula, it's nothing, and she was like, Megan, I have been seeing this. I see how you are around him. I'm telling you what's going on. She admitted, you know, I'm in love with him. I've been in love with him since I was 16. Megan told my mom that God is sending her a older, mature man. I remember my mom telling me that she said, no, he is married. That's not how God works. Um, so you need to back off. You need to leave him alone. 
The church was her baby too. I know she didn't want to ruin her or David's reputation. So I, I, I guess she was trying to protect him. And the Tuesday Paul passed away, I was going to have a meeting. I was going to tell Megan, back off. You need to back off. During the interviews with the church members, some of them had said that they had heard Megan say it would be soon that they'd be together. Tell me about the conversation you had with Megan that you thought was just really inappropriate. She did tell me that, you know, that she knew she was going to marry a pastor and he was going to be quite older than her and everybody was going to be really shocked when it happened. She said that. She, she did told you that. that. Yes. God has a plan set before you. God has a destiny set before you. I remember around January, I'd ask her, I'd say, hey, Paula, we had a great service Sunday morning. Wasn't it a great service? And she got up, she walked right past me, she closed the door behind me to the office, locked it, walked right back in front of me and stood right in front of me. And she goes, what I'm getting ready to tell you, you cannot tell anybody, Mike. Do you understand? I did what she told me. I didn't say anything. And I am haunted by that. I am. We had heard, we my sister both had heard several rumors going around about Megan, a member of the church. How would you characterize their relationship? I mean, I knew that she was in love with my stepdad. I didn't care too much to think about it. But then, after my mom's death, we started thinking, some, there, there's more to it than, than just, you know, her. Immediately after Paula's death, David started taking Megan with him places. He didn't even wait. I mean, he didn't, I'm not even sure that it was a week after her funeral. A few days after she passed away, we went out to this little Mexican place to eat, and David actually made my friend move over so that Megan could sit down next to him. And, you know, there's a lot of little flirtatious kind of things going on that I noticed. Certain red flags started to appear, and as we dug deeper, and witnesses came forward. I found out that there was also inappropriate um, behavior prior to the fire. Uh, Michael Stedham, associate pastor in our church. You know, I mean, you're suspicious about some things. Okay. I know there was an affair before. I mean, I, I believe that with all my heart. Back in January, when I walked in that office that day, Paula told me that she had found Megan and David in the altar, holding each other in a very odd position that they shouldn't have been in, hugging each other. And uh, I said, what? If it had been anybody else telling me, I would not have believed it. David was, what, 47, 48 years old. Megan's 25. Wow. <laughs> Here I am, the associate. This is my best friend. And this just blasts me right in the face. Boom. But she told me, we don't need to discuss this. This would have a tremendous bad effect on this whole church. If this got out, we would lose everybody. I've forgiven him, and you need to forgive him too. I did what she told me. I didn't say anything until now. After the interviews with the church members, I really, really wanted to talk to David Allen myself in person. That was a very interesting interview. He came in acting like he was in college. He had a polo shirt on with the collar up, sunglasses, his hair spiked up. 
We asked David if he'd take a polygraph, and he said yes. And so um, we had an ATF agent standing by to conduct a polygraph exam. The ATF's policy is the, they don't film the polygraph, but we did start filming after the interview. The machine doesn't lie. Just understand that you're, you're going to bear the responsibility of what happens here. Yes, sir. Okay. We wanted but you to tell the truth. The, the, That's the, not what happened. The polygraph tests or any of the other stuff, I had you know, no idea. Deception was indicated on all questions that were asked during the polygraph exam. Well, I'm going to go ahead and go. I'm going to come you're free to go whenever you want to, but we're going to continue on the investigation. After the interview with David, I had to sift through the lies. And one stop was to the life insurance uh, agent who had told me, yes, that they had come in to try to obtain a, a policy, but David didn't pass the physical. We went to get life insurance, and they turned us down because of me. It was a half-truth that, yes, he was turned down, but Paula wasn't. There was an active insurance policy on Paula for $250,000. Not only did David Allen know that there was insurance, he had gone to the insurance agent to try to obtain that money. At that point, motive was established, that he had $250,000 coming and a new girlfriend. Investigators in the summer of 2011 were very aware that there was some type of relationship between David Allen and Megan um, to the degree that he may have had a reason to start this fire. Megan had been spoken with briefly, and she had denied the physical relationship with David Allen at that time. In light of that, we reinitiated contact with several witnesses. The main thing that I remember is that it's like David, it's almost like David knew that Paul was going to die because he said that they would be together soon. And within about three days, Paul was dead. She told you that? Megan, Megan told you that? Yes. And David said that they would be together soon? In so many words, yes. And then three days later, Paul yes. was dead. Motive in this case uh, was very clear. And then in November, we finally got the report from the investigation from the insurance company. It's revealed that they believe that it was intentionally set. Acetone was the ignition factor for the fire. But that doesn't mean that that's an automatic arrest. Um, it was important for us to really get our bearings about what evidence was collected and how strong that evidence would play in a trial. I received an email from one of Paula's daughters saying that there was a wedding announcement in the newspaper with Megan and David. When we saw it in the newspaper, I mean, I was in complete shock. He felt that she was the only one that supported him, but I, I did not expect for them to be engaged. And really, I mean, this is what, maybe six, eight months? Establishing the timeline for the relationship was, was astronomically important for us because Mr. Allen and Megan had been denying any type of inappropriate relationship before the fire. And so we engaged an incredible forensic investigator. He really opened up the forensic cell phone information. There was constant text messages with Megan all times of the day and night. They were intimate texts. They were intimate texts. And the last message that David Allen received that night of the fire was from Megan Allen. We had enough probable cause where an arrest warrant was issued. Shortly after they returned from their honeymoon, the sheriff's office was able to locate him and arrested him.
we were truly focused on David Allen. But as we moved forward, really what we were looking for was exactly what did Megan know? And did she participate in this in any capacity, in any way? Hello, this is a prepaid collect call from David Allen, an inmate at Coryell County Sheriff's Department. Hey. Hey, what's up? I was just wondering, um, does your attorneys, do they know that I'm pregnant? David had to decide if the woman that was carrying his child was going to go down with him for what he had done with Paula. The death of Paula Allen is a made-for-TV case. Local pastor falls in love with a young parishioner and is trying to find a way out of his marriage while at the same time hanging on to the clergy. It's sensational. It's sexy. It's what people are drawn to. You remember March 17th? Uh huh. I, think I do. Okay. I okay, do. Make sure you tell them about all that too, because that's all in the phone stuff and everything. Throughout the investigation, Megan had been denying any type of inappropriate relationship. We were able to clearly establish that that was not true. Uh, I have no problem telling them that that we kissed on the 17th. Baby, that was it. Quit. I mean, my Don't gosh. Don't talk about stuff like that on the phone, baby. I know. I know, baby. <laughs> I know. But there was never any evidence that we could rely on that would support that she actually knew what David Allen would do that night to Paula. And so we really wanted a situation where Megan understood that there was some accountability with her statements. Megan was brought to the grand jury. In Texas, once you're sworn to tell the truth under oath to a grand jury, should you lie or misrepresent the truth, you can be charged with perjury. Through the course of the grand jury questioning, it was very clear that Megan intended to avoid providing truthful answers about the progression and the seriousness of their relationship. So Megan was charged with aggravated perjury. That's a third degree felony in the state of Texas. It carries with it a two to 10 year prison time. It's a very serious offense. Megan certainly created a bargaining chip uh, dynamic. One of the most challenging types of offenses to prosecute and prove is arson. If a jury found David Allen not guilty because of a disagreement over the arson science, it was infallible. A potential solution was dismissing Megan's case in conjunction with David Allen pleading uh, to the arson causing death. I'm not really sure who called us, but someone told us that you need to get up here. David's ready to um, accept a plea deal. To us, it meant more to hear David admit to arson and we would be able to live a somewhat normal life with him behind bars. In Texas, the defendant doesn't have to make any statement related to the offense. So Mr. Allen uh, never said anything related to what he did. 
What I believed happened on the late hours of March 21st, 2011, David Allen received a text message from Megan, and I believe that that text message caused friction or a fight between him and Paula. That fight uh, resulted in David incapacitating Paula in some manner. David got the accelerant, the acetone, and started that fire. And I believe he then crawled out the window and then pretended to put on this facade or this show for law enforcement. I remember pulling up. David, he was on the ground on all fours. And he goes, Paula, Paula. I just knew something wasn't right, but I didn't want to believe what I thought in my heart. So many thoughts. It's hard to process them all. This is my first time in eight years talking about this in a way that I'm talking about it. I'm not currently involved in any church. It is shaking my faith to the core, absolutely. There's a lot of people that will never darken the door of a church again because of this. But it's not the church, and it's not God. It's just a man that decided to do something evil. When we buried my mom, we buried her in David's family plot. But after everything was said and done, it just, it never felt right. And the double headstone with David's name on it, I, I wanted her to have her own headstone and I didn't want her to be buried there. I wanted her to be closer to home. It was really hard because I didn't want to have to move her. Glad we did. She's closer to us. She's where she belongs now.